Hello, I'm Robin and welcome to the October edition of Molten Music Monthly. It's cold, autumnal, hardly. It's plummeted, is what's happening over here. And it's raining and there's potential for storm right now. Luckily we're not flooded out like some people are, but we're just gonna have to get on with things. We have so much to go through. There's been a little mini explosion of bits and pieces out there that are probably worth talking about, or at least I'm gonna give it a go and I'm gonna start talking pretty fast, I think, just to claw our way through it. So no time, no time for willy nillying, no time for just talking about the bits and pieces and the other things that I quite fancy looking about and then maybe uh, looking at a thing over here and going, oh, well, that's interesting. No, 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 no time for any of that. In fact, time's already run on so much so that we should probably say goodbye. But hey, let's see what we can rattle through this month. Okay, here goes. Personas goes Atmos with Studio One 6.5. Staff Pad can write itself. Silent Audio goes infinitely vintage. IK has a universe of pianos. Roland is two times gayer. Blue Marble does synths in space. 1010 Music has sampled an orange. Waldorf loses all its knobs. Qubit wanders in the dunes. Akai outpushes push. GeForce aces the OBX plugin. Heinbach does something weird with telephone lines, but then he's always doing something weird with telephone lines. Game Changer fakes the plasma voice. Noise Engineering brings back Basimilus. Korg does MIDI 2.0. Arturia stuffs more into an audio fuse. Expert Sleepers does an octave fuzz. Transistor Sound Labs drops more acid. Infrasonic will warp the CZ101 out of you. Yamaha has a new montage. Sonic Charge gets into genetics. Minimal Audio drops the ball with current and then just about recovers. And I think DivKid is about to drop a new module in about like in about half an hour, but I don't know whether it will make it into this because I'm doing it right now and I don't know if I'll have time to do it later when it's out and when it's out. But anyway, he's got a thing coming out. So if you haven't seen it, go and check it out. So it's bound to be pretty awesome. It's made with Instruo and it's probably doing all sorts of really cool and interesting things that you need to have in your rack. So you might as well go and just pause this, go on over to Instruo's website and just check out and see what that is and then come back and you can tell me about it in the comments. That would be great because the likelihood is I don't really have the time to cover it right now and it's just that's just it's just you know just out of reach it feels and that's probably enough about that but first a very quick something about Rastronica and Synth Fest these are two marvelously distinctive synthesizer events that happened weekends apart just after the last Molten Monthly I went to both had a fantastic time at both <laughs> Uh, enjoyed them immensely and there was lots of good stuff to see. I've done a video on Brustronica in particular because that one I showed all the new stuff that I saw. So there's things like uh, the Play All Day Play Fader, the Stochastic Stranger things, uh, the Vino Looper from Venus Instruments, uh, the Vostok Atlas multi-channel filter and the RYK FM module all sort of new stuff that I really enjoyed having a poke around with. So do go and check those out in those videos which already exist. So I'm not gonna go over those again now. Right, let's, let's move along, let's get on with it. So Presonus upgrades Studio One to version 6.5. The point five has given us lots of extra things. It's an interesting one actually. I've, I've reviewed it for Sound on Sound, written about it a bit and bits and pieces. I've had an opportunity to try it out and to really soak myself in it a little bit in order to try to articulate what it's about. But ultimately what you get is Dolby Atmos within Studio One 6.5. The, the whole thing, the renderer, um, some plugins are all upgraded to be able to cope with that kind of surround sound. And it's very, very interesting. It's both interesting and completely pointless. And it's, it's one of those really strange technologies where you think, I've got no use for this. When am I ever going to use this? I mean, ultimately, I'm lucky if I get something up on, on Bandcamp or Spotify. You know, an MP3 is ultimately what I'm looking for, not some kind of 9.4.1.6.8 surround sound jobby. Besides, look at my space. Where on earth am I going to put any of those speak? I've got to buy how many? Sp I've got to buy 16 speakers. Oh, right, well that, yeah, yeah. No bother then, no, no bother. So it's interesting, this fascination with Atmos at the moment. I mean, I've got a friend of mine who works with, uh, with Pro Tools and with DigiDesign, um, Avid, whatever it is they call themselves these days. 
And apparently there's been a huge explosion in Atmos and an interest in mixing in surround and atmospheric stuff to give you positional spatial audio. <laughs> but again, unless we're all doing it for cinema, what I'm, I'm really, you know, I'm trying to get excited about it because it is interesting and it is quite fascinating and it is perhaps the future or is it because how do we get to listen to it is the thing. Now, within the Dolby Render and within Studio 16.5, there is what's called binaural listening and monitoring and experiencing of Dolby Atmos on a single pair of headphones. You can wear headphones and you can listen to it and it will move. The sound will be placed around your head. So you get kind of a, a representation of what Atmos could feel like if you were sitting in the in the Odeon cinema. <laughs> I could say, are we all writing for cinema? Is is that where we all are now? It just seems slightly odd. I mean, I I don't mind the idea of wearing headphones because a lot of people listen to music on earbuds or headphones as they go to and from work. Fair enough. So there is a market for binaural mixing, potentially. But it ends up being this, this singular experience. You're not going to be able to put on a record at home and play it through your stereo and experience it in a in a surround Atmos mix. You can't. And the sort of home cinema equipment that you can get, the speakers, the sound bar and bits and pieces, are all a bit ropey, <laughs> to be fair. I mean, Ben Jordan did an interesting video on this and how it, it just really doesn't kind of work and what is it all about. And this is where we are. So it's kind of this strange thing that everybody who's producing music is clamouring to do Atmos. And yet there's so few destinations for it unless you are actually writing for cinema. There are exceptions to that. I mean, Apple Music apparently wants Atmos mixes, I guess. They want that to be able to drop it onto the helmet thing they're going to try to sell in a couple of years' time, or whenever it is that that thing comes out. Or I guess it will run on a pair of earbuds, so it has some potential there again. But how much more than stereo? Actually, if you go to the Dolby website, right, they do this comparison, stereo to spatial audio, and it's brilliant because they go, right, here's stereo, right? And they play bah, in one ear, and then bah, in the other ear. And you go, well, that's not exactly stereo, but I understand what you're saying. And then they go, in comparison, here's spatial. And there's like this lovely orchestral, beautiful thing going -oo -oo, around your ears. It's like, right, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good comparison. That's a really unbiased way of, of A being stereo, uh, stereo, to bioral. In all. Brilliant. I'm totally, totally, totally convinced. So anyway, I have more to say about Atmos, I think, so I'm going to do a bit of a workshop on it and bits and pieces for, for Studio One. I'm going to get into it a bit deeper because, as I say, it is fascinating and it does make you work on your mix differently and think about it. And you're suddenly splitting everything up again rather than having anything bust to a certain place because you want to have individually placed things. Or ultimately, does it just mean it's harder? So now, rather than, hooray, I had a rough, you know, I just panned a few things. Great, sounds great. Let's, let's stick that on a, on a CD or reduce that to an MP3 and put that somewhere. No, now I've got a thing about placing every bloody thing in every bloody place. So mixing is now going to take longer. Awesome. <laughs> but if you're interested in playing with that, then Studio One 6.5 is a good place because it's free, it's part of the software, it's all in there, everything you need. It's got a reverb, it's got a surround delay, which is quite interesting to play with. All the tools are there and you can render out the relative, the relevant files for whatever it is you're trying to send this Atmos thing to. So, you know, potentially interesting, but it's, it's, it's existence as a thing. It just makes me feel like home 3D, you know, because I love 3D movies, absolutely love 3D mo movies. And I unfortunately, when I upgraded my TV, I could not buy a television which supported 3D because it had essentially, I suppose, failed in the home market. Uh, I still have a projector which can project in 3D, which is something. <laughs> so I can still watch my back catalogue of 3D movies if I try hard enough. But it kind of feels like Atmos is going to be a bit like that because you can't all sit together in a room and listen to it unless you have a massive speaker system you, you can't do it you can't i guess you could all individually be on headphones if you have a system that can kick out lots of different headphone outputs it's just it sounds like too much of a faff and if something is too much of a faff then it's just ultimately not going to fly in the mainstream or at home i would say
That's far too much time taken up talking about that. Let's move on. Staff Pad. I love Staff Pad. If you've never seen it before, it's a notation writing piece of software where you can write on a tablet, start it off on the Microsoft Surface uh, with the pen, and you can hand write scores and it translates it into proper notes and plays it back through an orchestra. It's just a beautiful piece of software, a beautiful interface uh, for beautiful people who make beautiful music. Now, they've just upgraded it to do something even more beautiful even you know they're bringing in more of the beauty and that's that it can now listen to you playing on a piano and it will transcribe that so essentially it's like pitch to midi conversions it's hearing the notes but it's hearing the entire piece not just necessarily melody lines and pulling that in which i think is very interesting very interesting apparently it's through some kind of machine learning and ai in understanding and identifying the the notes and the phrasing and the way because it's not just taken in the notes it has to then uh, you know show and represent visually those notes in some kind of coherent way and that's where the clever stuff starts coming in i think the other thing they've added is midi <laughs> not too bad not too bad it's only been around for 10 years and the staff pad's only been around for 10 years and they finally put midi in it so you can play a midi controller keyboard and the notes will appear so that's a nice addition too but staff pad if you've if it's new to you i would recommend checking it out it's available on the ipad and on windows surface and is superb i've had a good conversation with silent audio who have this brand new uh, software synthesizer called infinite flow and it was an interesting conversation because they're a startup, small software company who've been developing this thing for a couple of years. They think it's flipping awesome and they think everyone should know about it. And they've had some difficulty in getting getting it out there. I mean, when they came to me, um, this is via Gear News, I think, they, you know, they, they really hadn't quite grasped what marketing was about. And I don't mean that in some kind of patronising sort of way. They didn't have a decent video. They had like a 30 second teaser, which told you nothing. It, it could have been anything at all ever. And the website didn't really show you what the synth did. I couldn't find a screenshot of the actual synth. So there were a few holes in what it was they were trying to do. And I was hopefully, I think, able to help them over a few hopes and get them to, uh, to, to develop that a little bit and understand it and then, and then do a you know, do a, do a better video on it because I, I really had, I didn't have enough information to even write it up as a news article. Anyway, I want to get past all of that because they've done better now and I've had a go and it's an interesting synthesizer. The idea is that it's, it's very much based on analog synthesis. So it's all about analog oscillators, lots of them, eight of them, I think, but wired into a very, a very interesting, very sort of retro futuristic interface that when you move parameters, you've got data and stuff coming up, you've got a nice display, you've got other visual representations of going on along with modulation, filter movement, animations, things like that. And all of it has this slightly, as I say, crusty technology vibe to it. And one of the things that they're particularly hot on is including lots of different imperfections pulled from other synthesizers. So you can make it, you can sort of throw at it the imperfections of the Juno six or 60 or throw it cs80 imperfections or other big analog synths you throw them the 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 bits from those synthesizers which kind of make it characterful and wobbly and it does have a really nice sound so if you've not come across it i'd highly recommend going and checking it out you can get a seven day demo to download and try out some of the sounds and I, I think what I'd like about it in a nutshell is that it's simple enough for you to just go in and change a few waveforms on some oscillators, add a filter and build it out into stretching those envelopes. And it just sounds nice. It's not overcomplicated. It's not giving you masses and masses of information. It's it's well contained. It's about analog synthesis and you definitely feel that. So you're not farting around with wavetables or other weird bits and pieces. It's stuff that you understand understand and it sounds good so that's got to be good enough to give it a go i came multimedia piano verse right okay i confess i don't know anything about this nothing at all i've just literally looked at it on on the website it didn't really cross my desk i'm afraid i mean it's a whole bunch of pianos i mean what is there more to say than that do we need more pianos oh of course we do undoubtedly we need more pianos now this is the finest collection of world-class pianos uh, meticulously tuned and then recorded and sampled and then robots have come along and smashed it around a little bit to assist with the unparalleled accuracy and precision 
a fat sampling. <laughs> so it's got all the usual pianos, the Bosendorfers, the Steinways, the Yamahas, uh, the bits and pieces. So, I mean, go, go and check it out because I'm, I'm only going to sit here and probably be rude about it because I don't know anything about it. But I imagine it sounds incredible. Ico Mold Media have done fabulous work in getting into the underside of sample based instruments to give you a lot of control as well as building in huge uh, echoey cavernous spaces in which to run them because of their ability to uh, produce extraordinary DSP effects. I'm weirded out slightly by the, the plans. Plans starting at 1499. I'm going to press the buy now button to see what on earth that means. Oh I see so you can buy it you can uh, <laughs> You can get all the pianos, $14.99 a month, I guess forever, or 150 quid a year. I hate subscription. <laughs> I do. Sometimes it's a necessary evil. Is it a necessary evil with pianos? I don't know. I mean, sometimes I just want to splurge 100 quid on an interesting piece of software that's going to give me some pleasure for a little bit of time. I don't want to be paying every month for it, necessarily. But hey, that's what we have, and it looks like there's different or more expanded pianos you can add to it. I wouldn't be at all surprised if before too long there will be a free version of piano verse which comes with like a basic piano or two and to which you then add more like you do with um, the amplitude various versions of that but cool more pianos let's move on a Roland has a new synthesizer or at least it's a sequel to a synthesizer the Gaia 2 I think it's Gaia actually I'm gonna go with Gaia before anyone gets too uh, upset of my playfulness <laughs> the Gaia 2 uh, in a nutshell I think because all it needs is a nutshell is that this is a sub 1000 pound synthesizer the sort of synthesizer where you could go to a synthesizer shop and you could play with this and you could go cool well that sounds fantastic and take it away and have a lovely time I think that's all that's important about this particular sort of synthesizer it doesn't have to have all of the things, all of the intricate bits and pieces that perhaps the real synth heads like, but what it does have is a field of knobs that's well laid out, a nice display, motion controlled, all sorts of jiggery pokery going on, and a nice huge range of lovely sounds. It's just kind of a, a decent, all purpose, never gonna let you down kind of synthesizer. You could put other things in this space like something like the modway from Korg. Well, actually Korg has got a whole load of synth in, in this space. Whether it's the, 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 the Prophecy, is it? If I can't remember. The mini log kind of sits in this space to some degree, but more like the modway or the wave state. Those sorts of synths, as I say, they've got a lot of different sounds in. Uh, it's kind of the, a more serious, more synthesizer focused version of a home workstation keyboard. So it's got a good sequencer on board, it's got good controls, it works, it sounds fantastic, it's got good effects. It's like the most inoffensive synthesizer you could possibly imagine. No one would be unhappy with it. Place it down in front of anyone. If you don't know what you're doing, you can get some nice presets and nice sounds. If you do, you can start modulating and messing stuff about. So I think it's just a, a decent attempt at uh, a family home synthesizer that anyone could use, anyone could get fun out of. It's got all the knobs and sliders that you need and a bit of fun and sequencing. I think it's, I think that's all right. The Blue Marble Synthesizer, fantastic idea. I love this idea. It's absolutely of no use to anyone. <laughs> I love the idea. The idea is you get a marble, you stick it in a box with some sensors around it, stick it up in space. <laughs> and then the marble moves around in, in zero gravity, you know, being prodded by things or flapped at things and, and various things poke it and it's got sounds and centers around it to, to track its movement. All of that data that's being generated is then is then beamed down to some kind of server somewhere and it gets farmed out and it, it, it like moves it moves the odd knob on a synthesizer. So it's an experiment of trying to investigate how how weightlessness could affect um, the, the parameters or the voltage generation within a synthesizer to ultimately make space control your synth. I mean, it's it's brilliant. <laughs> I mean, it's stupid, but it's brilliant. And I love the fact that there's a couple of real celebrities who have got on board with this. Andrew Huang and Ben Jordan in particular 
Uh, awesome. I love these guys. Uh, they know what they're doing. They're intelligent people. And they've gone, yeah, well, that sounds like fun. Let me uh, let me give that a go. And so undoubtedly, they're going to benefit from receiving some of the data from this this satellite that has a marble on it spinning about. And that will be great. What do the rest of us do? Well, the interesting thing is, is that in order to make it happen, they've decided to put it on Kickstarter. So all of us who will never get access to this data get the opportunity to give them money just to see it happen. <laughs> And that tickles me, that tickles me, and it, and other people too, because have, just checking out the Kickstarter, I mean, the goal was just over 40 grand, which is not a huge goal for putting something in space, I wouldn't have thought. And they've got eight days to go, and they've not quite reached 10 grand yet. Because the problem is, is that you don't know why would you give them money. I mean, it's a nice idea and all that, but... <laughs> For for whose benefit? I mean, for, for what? What am I going to get out of it? I'll get a VST plugin, which apparently emulates it. It doesn't actually get the data from the actual thing, because that's too hard. You have to pay serious money to get access to the actual data. But you could get a VST plugin, which sort of does it. I mean, in, in some ways, you... I mean, the, I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying to, trying to find a positive... Trying to find a positive spin on it. Why would I want to give them money to put something in space, to vaguely control my synthesizer. Is that interesting? I mean, it kind of is. It's like, you know, it's like generating voltages from plants, from potted plants and other bits and pieces. Put a little sensor on it, you plug it into a particular module, and it gathers that voltage, and that allows you to control certain things. I mean, that's, that's interesting to some degree, but it's interesting because you can witness that connection. You can understand it, and you can go, oh, that's really interesting. I'm using a banana to control my synthesizer. I mean, if you took all of that away and just said, here's a bunch of random uh, bits of data that I promise you have come from a pineapple, then it's just not as interesting. And I think that's the problem with this. You don't have any direct connection to that satellite. You don't have any ability to access this data, at least as far as I'm aware, as far as my understanding of it goes. And so what's, what's the point? You're funding uh, a bunch of otherwise privileged people who are going to get privileged access to this data that will move a couple of knobs on your synth. Ah, Because it's a beautiful idea. I love the idea. This is like silent running. It's like you know, packing the world into a, into a little um, glass case with a little robot to tend it and send it off into the stars and you know, to receiving information from the cosmos, which is controlling our synthesizers. I mean, it's a beautiful, beautiful idea. But it, it just needs someone who's got a deep pocket to go, yeah, I'll pay for it and off we go. It's not, I don't think the rest of us have a whole lot to gain from it, to be honest. But I think it's fabulous. I love the fact that uh, Andrew and Ben and such like are involved in it. And um, I'm just constantly kind of not surprised that it hasn't really taken off quite like they think it should have done. <laughs> 1010 Music have another nano box. This time it's Tangerine. Tangerine is a sampler. It's the same idea as a lemon drop and the the, the other one what was the other one plum, um, juicy strawberry. I don't know. A little tiny palm sized little boxes, couple of knobs on the top, couple of buttons, and a fabulously interesting synthesizer engine built in with a bunch of filters and envelopes, LFOs, all the usual synthesizer architecture, but with different sound engines. So you've had one which has been virtual analog, I think, another one which has been granular. This one is a sampler. Simple sampling, easy sampling. You've got eight pads on the touch screen which you can trigger things. Or of course you can sequence it via, uh, via MIDI or, or whatever you want. You can do 24 voices, 16 layers. It has multi-sampling capability and comes with a whopping great big piano. I think as a concept, it's great. I, I love these little boxes. They pack a lot in there. And what I like about them is how you have this compartmentalized sound. So they, they kind of give you uh, like a, a plug-in, a VST plug-in type of feel, I think, to some degree, but in these little hardware boxes, because they don't really have much in a way of control themselves. I mean, they have a touchscreen, for heaven's sake, what are you talking about? So you have as much control as you have perhaps over a phone. So loads is what I'm saying, but it doesn't radiate that, if you see what I mean. It's only got a couple of encoders on the top. But it's these little boxes of sound that you can wire into a, into a non-computerized desktop system and have different areas completely sorted out in terms of sound source. And this completely solves the, the problem of wanting to have sample sounds. There it is. Off you go. No bother. 
It has all sorts of wizards built in for sample slicing and arranging and, and multi-sampling and, and all that, all those bits and pieces. And they're very cool. But they're four hundred dollars. They're, they're just they just feel expensive. I can't help but feel <laughs> that each of these boxes, while very, very capable, with a lot of interesting sound engine inside and a simple enough interface to get hold of, it's just it's just not a lot. I mean, it goes back to, I mean, I had that moan the other month about mini groove boxes, palm of your hand stuff with just no interface that uh, we're expected to really rave about. And although these have a better interface, because the display is great, it's big, it's the touch screen, it gives you access to lots of stuff. And these are not so complex that you get lost in the menu system. Um, but in some ways, they're not complex enough, really, to warrant such a price tag, perhaps. I don't know. I don't know about that. I mean, value and money is really difficult thing to try to attribute to a device. It really depends on what you see as being valuable and whether that helps you to make your music or it's an interesting um, addition to what you're doing. I mean, heck, for $400, that's like the price of a single Euro module. So what the heck am I saying when this perhaps potentially has so much more in it? See, I've, I think they would really fly as as Eurac modules, to be honest. <laughs> I think they really would. I mean, they do have that uh, Bitbox Blue thing, mixer thing now in Eurac, and they have those other 1010 larger modules that run all sorts of things. But I think something more focused like this could be very interesting in Eurac. And then, heck, doesn't matter what the price is, because we'll pay anything you like. <laughs> so there you go. It's orange, and it's a sampler. It looks pretty groovy. Uh, it's just up to you whether that's worth the money. The Waldorf Iridium Core is a 12 voice desktop shrunk down version of the Iridium keyboard. Minus all the knobs. Let's get rid of all those knobs. They're just getting in the way. What we want is just a nice big screen. Oh, we're coming back to 1010 again. But this time it's a big screen. Big screen, few encoders around the side, a couple of pads for firing off stuff we're not really sure about yet. But essentially what you get in the Waldorf Iridium Core is the, the massive sound engine that you also get in the larger keyboards, in the Quantum. So you get an extraordinary range of sounds, an extraordinary uh, foundation of sound engines within this thing that are gonna be create all sorts of sounds. And it's bringing it down in price just a, just a tiny bit, tiny bit. It's still unreachable for most of us. <laughs> but for some people who can't quite afford the over 2,000 pounds, whatever it was for the original keyboard, this is just under 2,000, I think. Yeah, and you get three oscillators and you can be all different sound engines. You've got wavetable, virtual analog, uh, granular, resonator, and kernel, which is kind of a, a an FM engine, isn't it? I think of some kind. So essentially everything. You've got everything in the one thing, big touchscreen display um, to access all the parameters on encoders and bits and pieces. I mean, it's a great sound source that doesn't have to take up masses of room like the keyboard version does. So if you've always been interested in Waldorf sounds and what the heck is going on with their massive quantum, then this is definitely the way in for you. Qubit having another go at doing some weird stuff, which is what we always like. I mean, woof, do they boggle? They like to boggle. It's, it's funny how Qubit, I mean, I've got a range of Qubit modules because I, I keep asking to review them and then I get a bit stuck. <laughs> and I'm it's like, oh, I just, I'm not quite sure what I'm doing with this one. However, it's like half of them are my absolute go-to, we we'll use them all the time modules. And the other half are like, I don't understand what any of this means. And that seems to be where I am with Qubit. I, I, it's, I absolutely love what they do. I just don't always understand it. So the latest one is the Mojave. Mojave or the Majave, the Mojave, the Mojave, the Mojave, which is, it's a granular thing. It's about dunes, it's about sand, it's about grains, it's about the movement and swishing of time and space and objects and flowing and ebbs of wind and stuff. It's got knobs like whirl, whirl, got whirl and dirt, distribute and structure. Sounds fantastic. I'm looking forward to plugging it in, actually. It's got a really nice thing on the back. So this is literally just turned up. And I hope it's going to be fantastic. And I will, and I do intend to spend more time with some other uh, Qubit modules that I've got that I've never quite gotten around to doing a video on. And namely the Nautilus. Uh, the Nautilus in particular, I think. And that deserves a bit more of my time. 
It's one of those modules that you you put in thinking it's a delay, and then it's not quite a delay. It's something else, and but you never got time quite to work out exactly what it is, <laughs> and so you end up ignoring it because it's not really doing the delay thing that you thought it would. So you then end up using another delay. But anyway, I plan to get to the bottom of that and this one as soon as I can. Right, Akai have pushed something out everyone keeps talking about. I'm like, it's a little bit past me by sort of push controllers and things like that. So I've never really used them. I mean, I do enjoy using things like Ableton Live and I have used launch pads and bits and pieces, but the whole trying to really control Ableton Live in more recent days, it's like, no, I, I don't think I can be bothered. I'd rather be controlling uh, something like this, to be fair. But there is a new kid in town called the APC64. Now, Akai keep giving this whole um, Ableton Live thing a really good go. They've had all sorts of controllers out there. This one apparently has really captured people's imagination. So first of all, you've got your eight by eight pad of glow up RGB type things with which you can launch clips and you can navigate around and you can mix and you can trigger things and you can record, you can play it, you can sequence with it. You know, anything you could possibly do on an 8x8 grid is what Akai have built into this thing. But it's more than that. It extends past that to give you four touch modulation strips. Apparently those are very interesting. And you can build in performance controls, uh, modulation changes, mixing, all sorts of things using these, uh, these little controllers. They're a bit like the modulation strips you sometimes get on MIDI controllers, but you've got four of them, and that really changes the game, I think, in terms of, of live performance, where you don't have to be restricted by that whole keyboard paradigm with the mod wheels over here. You've got a, a, a different thing which lends itself to a different way of approaching and performing, and that is quite interesting. Did I say four? I meant eight. It's got eight touch strips. I mean, that's an enormous amount. So you can have a lot of stuff set up ready to control, which is fantastic. The pads also uh, have poly aftertouch, which you know, individual aftertouch on each pad. That's pretty epic. But maybe perhaps the, the biggest change this time around is it has its own sequencer internally. So it's not bound to Ableton Live. You don't have to use a computer with it at all. You can use it completely standalone. That's quite interesting. The internal sequencer has eight tracks of 32 steps. Uh, per track or per pattern, I think. It also has eight CV outputs, uh, which don't exactly correspond to eight tracks. I mean, potentially they could if they're just sending out pitch, but if you want to do pitch and gate, you're going to have to double up and take yourself down to four tracks. So, you know, compromises are in there, but it does mean you could end up with perhaps a four track MIDI, four track CV gate uh, sequencer. Yeah, or just go all MIDI if you like, or just go all pitch, or just go all modulation. I think it's its versatility is what it's showing that's really that's really what this is about. And whereas perhaps Ableton have focused on the glamour of the push with the, the little screens and the updates and the flashy lights and stuff, what Akai have done have actually built in the more ability to perform. It's given you more control, it's given you more connectivity. So it's taken you beyond what Ableton Live would be doing, and maybe that's not something that Ableton would be able to do because their focus would be purely on their software. Whereas Akai have been able to see a slightly bigger picture. Yeah, maybe that's it. Fun though, isn't it? Uh, G4 software added again with some Oberheim, and this time it's the OBX. This is the original, if you like, polyphonic synthesizer, the first one that, that Oberheim did that wasn't tied to all of their SEMs, those individual synthesizer modules. This was one synthesizer in one nice, big, fat, laid out keyboard. It's a beautiful synthesizer and GeForce have captured it beautifully, brilliantly, you know, first class. I mean, GeForce have been working with Oberheim to do this as they have done with the, the previous, the 8 voice and the other bits and pieces that they've done. And so this, this is going to be no different. It's, it's a fantastic rendering of a classic polyphonic synthesizer that is going to ooze charm, character and sumptuousness. They've added a few bits and pieces, some cross modulation, an extra LFO, uh, some more envelopes, flashing lights, you know, bells and whistles, little animated characters that run along and go yippee. I, I don't know, some, something along those sorts of lines. And it can now, of course, go up to 16 voices rather than the original eight. But, I mean, heck, if you're looking for that Oberheim sound in software, then this is absolutely where you need to go. Heimbach has released another plugin with Audio Thing. This one is called Lines. 
Apparently it's something to do with an obscure 1970s axle line simulator. Uh, is that an experimental synth? Nobody knows. Might be something to do with the telephone. Don't really know. I mean, High Bike likes to pull out old bits of equipment and strap them together and make them make sound. In fact, he's had an album that's just come out very, very recently, which is is simply superb. I mean, the, 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 the sound and the artistry he gets out of this stuff is is just breathtaking really and the fact that they're now being captured these ideas and these concepts are being captured into plugins i think is amazing i think it's a it's, it's a jolly work of art that's what it is apparently this is the sixth plugin from heimbach <laughs> that's incredible so what is this thing well who knows it's kind of yellowy orange got a few knobs on it apparently it's a bit of an experimental generative synthesizer as well as an its feedback effects plug-in it's got some signal processors it's got some sequencing you know you don't need me to tell you about it what you need to go is go and have a look <laughs> go and check out some of the videos and just listen to the thing going through its madness in search of a tune in search of soul in search of the very nature of being and the cosmos the Game Changer Audio Plasma Voice. Now this is fascinating. Now I might have this all completely wrong, but I have I have suspicions about this, which don't take anything away from the genius of this particular um, Eurorack module. I just find it kind of interesting because they could be a bit cagey about exactly what's going on, their technology, how it's working, is it working? There's a lot of that going on with Game Changer stuff. You're never quite sure if they're being upfront about everything. And this is all comes down to that alarmingly awesome uh, tube of Xeon gas, that plasma tube that's sparking on the front of the module. Now we saw this first of all at Superbooth where they had a sort of an experimental version where they were somehow managing to get some kind of melody out of it. I mean, ultimately out of these sorts of things, you get a crack, a crack type sound. You know, I mean, not even necessarily as dramatic as what you tend to see in the cinema when you get this it's more like a crack, crack, crack. And they've used it successfully within distortion to run audio through a crackling tube. And that gives it a particular, a particular flavor of distortion and overdrive. And that's great. You know, we like that, like that a lot. Trying to use that to generate an actual usable pitch is something else. But what I find interesting is that they put forward this idea as if that's what's happening. As if that somehow this sparky thing is generating something, some kind of rectification which is then being transformed into a tone which you can then play as a, oh, as a little lead synthesizer or a voice or something like that. I don't really think that's what's happening. I think the sparkiness is part of a signal process, is part of enveloping round or affecting or destroying other sounds that are built in. And they sort of talk about it. They talk about how there's a whole bunch of samples inside that you can use as waveform modulators, which to me means are the actual waveforms. So, as you know, digging in as far as I can read it, because it's, it's not entirely clear what the sound generation engine is. But what I think it is, is that they've got um, a bunch of samples of various instruments and things that you can play that are then sort of distorted and shaped by the plasma tube to give them that plasma sort of character which is then run through an, an analog signal chain with a filter and an envelope and VCA and other bits and pieces to act more like a regular synth. So, so you have in there this sparky discharge of of, no of noise which is then shaped by a sample which then gives you some kind of output. That is my understanding. I might be completely wrong. I don't know. But that seems to be, that seems to be, as far as I can work out, that's what's happening because you're not getting sound from this discharge by itself. It has to be applied to something else, built upon, expanded upon, rectified through, or, or some other word like that. But it's, I mean, it, it looks fantastic. And it also sounds interesting. I mean, there's a great demo uh, online of various sounds. And they all have this, you know, undoubtedly have this energy. And I don't know whether it's I'm visually interpreting and therefore imprinting energy upon what I hear. 
I don't know, but hey, it's convincing. <laughs> So where, whether or not the sound comes from this or from itself or from some other form, I don't really care because the sound is, is sparky and spitty and immediate and dangerous and aggressive and interesting. And all the time it's tied to that visual representation of this thing going on, yeah, which is, which is brilliant. The only slight weird thing is that the, the interface just looks overcomplicated. It's, it's a bit busy. Um, it seems to have different layers and stuff going on, which is a little bit unexpected, I think. Because it suddenly goes, oh, what do I do exactly? Whereas you just want to get straight in there with your fingers. Now, back in the summer, Noise Engineering retired or discontinued the Bersimilis Arteritus Alter, which is one of my favourite modules that I never get along with. I, I couldn't, I could never seem to get anything but but weird sort of glitchy noise out of it. Nothing that felt, I want to use this in a in a piece of something. It was always slightly too digital, slightly too uh, edgy, I think, for me. But anyway, it's something that I appreciated and also something that I know a lot of other people really enjoyed. And so the fact that it came to the end of its life seemed to be very, very sad. However, that was all really down to components and component choice and how components have gone end of life and bits and pieces. So they have brought in Noise Engineering, a new platform called Alia, Ailia, Ailia, I think. And upon this, they have given birth to a new Basimulus, the Basimulus Arteritus Alia, which is cool. So it's another DSP platform. There's three. There's the Manus Arteria as well, which is more of a lead synth. The Basimulus is always this percussion digital nightmare and they've got another one called De, De Bell, De Bell or something which is no I can't remember <laughs> phase modulation could be a bit of FME I think and so you can run these different firmwares on each other so you could buy one of these modules and run all three uh, different versions of itself if you so wish but the important thing is that they're that they're amazing uh, percussive digital monster, the Basimulus, is back and is more accessible. They've improved some of the knobs, they've added an encoder for the for the pitch to make that a little bit smoother. They've got an envelope output, some other little tweaks and bits and pieces just to make it that little bit easier to use. And that's no bad thing because I couldn't make head nor tail of the original one. So <laughs> it's good fun to have these back. Korg might have come up with a MIDI 2.0 keyboard. I mean, a genuinely might actually work with something MIDI 2.0 keyboard. Very exciting. It's been years since we saw that first Roland one. I think they didn't have anything to run with it. <laughs> Whereas now the Korg key stage has, I believe, fully MIDI 2.0 compatibility and there might even be things he could use it with. Now I can't tell you off the top of my head what those things are, but I think people have have used it. If I'm not wrong, I mean I think Luke Pop might have done a video on it, probably running it with something which allowed him to show how MIDI 2.0 worked to some degree. Which I think the, the basics of it is that you're supposed to plug your keyboard in and it just works with stuff. I mean that's all we've ever asked of MIDI anyway. And for the most part that's kind of what happens. All right you might have to do a little bit of mapping to start with. So hopefully that mapping stage has now been and you can just plug in the key stage and it just works with whatever it is you got up on the screen. I won't believe it until I see it. <laughs> but that seems to be the general idea. So that could be excellent. There's a 49 key version or a 61 key version. It's got poly aftertouch, which means each note has its own individual aftertouch. So you're talking about MPE type expressive performance, which is awesome. And all part of the, uh, the MIDI 2.0 spec. All you're going to need, of course, is for all of your other stuff to understand what on earth MIDI 2.0 is all about. Arturia have a new audio fuse. This one's called the 16 Rig. So let's say 16 inputs. Yeah, well, probably. It's got a pair of mics on the front, the rest are on the back, and outputs and ADAT. So lots of connections. The interesting thing about this, I think, is that it does have uh, some DC coupled outputs. Cool, eight of those at least, I think, which is a nice thing. So you can run your computer into your modular control, a bit of stuff. Good, great. That should be standard. What's a bit less standard is that I believe you have the ability to control the internal mixing and routing of the 16 rig via a MIDI controller. So you can connect up any little MIDI slider or pot thing and control the mixing engine of the audio fuse without having to be connected to a computer. That is a really nice feature and really gives you an opportunity 
to use the audio fuse beyond itself, you know, beyond your usual studio situation. So that, I think that's quite interesting. Expert Sleepers have a new module called the Sicily, I believe, and it is based on an octave fuzz. Octave fuzz is a fat old guitar pedal. And now, I mean, there doesn't seem to bear any relation between the two. There's no sort of, you don't look at the Sicily and go, oh yeah, right, that's definitely a distortion pedal. No, but the sound is in there somewhere. It's, it has this ability to uh, to break apart uh, whatever you're running through it and just to nile it up. And it comes by sort of pitch shifting the input on top of itself to sort of smash into each other in interesting ways. I think Jimi Hendrix used it all the time. <laughs> it needed to be purple or something. It, it needed to have something else about it in order to make it feel more grungeable, more woodstocky, perhaps. But hey, expert sleepers are sticking to their guns with their design and their layout and their set and the way they use things and those fabulously light up sockets that they use. <laughs> and so they're sticking to their guns. And what you get perhaps in Sicily that you don't get in the pedal is a lot of CV control. So you've got modulation control over all sorts of things are happening. And when you put in, in complex waveforms as opposed to simple ones which are pitch shifted against each other like you would with a guitar, you get all sorts of interesting tones and timbres and different flavours that spill out of that. We all like a bit of phase distortion, or at least we think we do, because we think we liked the Casio synthesizers when they were about, the CZ, this, that and the other, and maybe we did. I know that I drooled over one for quite, for quite a while in Cook's Music in Norwich back in the day, but never quite managed to actually walk out the shop with one. But heck, uh, the CZ phase distortion Casio styled synthesis is something which has been a little bit desirable and yet rarely found. Now we have Warp Core. Now Warp Core is, it's a crazy looking, well actually it looks a bit like Platts I have to say. It looks like it's got these different algorithms down the middle, which is exactly what it has. You've got two, two Warp Cores in one where you combine, I believe, uh, two different algorithms in order to create almost a limitless supply of weird tones and textures. It has an FM quality, but it also has a wavetable quality. It's, it's almost like those two things are being smashed against each other because of their phases being modulated and then therefore distorted. Is that a, I don't know. Another. But anyway, if you check out the demo, it makes some really interesting sounds. And that, I think, is the key because we don't have to understand how these things work. I don't know that it really matters. We just have to be able to appreciate the sounds that it can generate and see how it is that we can alter and affect and influence that. You can also switch in a triangle wave or a sawtooth wave to give it a little bit more ballast, I think, a little bit more familiarity so it doesn't sound completely weird and digital. And that's an interesting idea. But ultimately you've got a, a playground of a phase distortion, phase modulation, FM-esque sounds to mix and to blend and to bash together. Yamaha has a new montage. Now, my level of interest in the montage is somewhere around, <laughs> oh, I don't know. I, 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 in all honesty, I, it's the, uh, I just have no opinion on it, really, because I know that a lot of people really, really love these sorts of keyboards, these massive keyboards packed full of every form of synthesis known to man or beast, and they revel in it and have an ex exciting time hearing these huge sounds. I mean, I know I was there once. I, would, I, I did used to enjoy that. I remember the Korg M1 distinctly just having a fabulous time in the midst of that kind of workstation synthesizer keyboard but I feel like I've left that behind a long long time ago and I, I struggle to find anything that thrills me about it I know that I can sit down in front of one of these big things and I can play some presets and it's gonna be huge it's gonna be wow it's great and person I, I just want to come down to a little sine wave and mess about with that for a while a little sawtooth wave and just put a little filter on that and mess around with that but that's just me that's just me. I appreciate the fact that lots of people found these, find these things absolutely extraordinary. What I can tell you is that the Montage now has the AM1X engine inside, which on the one hand sounds very exciting until you realise, well, that's just a bunch of virtual analogue. Didn't it have that anyway? Yeah, it kind of 
already had normal sorts of <laughs> forms inside as most synths do ultimately of one form or another but this is particular to the AM1X engine which did something else with virtual analog no one can quite remember in a, in an interface it didn't have quite enough knobs on it that we liked back in the uh, back in the 2000s oh I don't know personally I would buy a Nord thing if I wanted a, a big awesome synthesizer because uh, I, I like the color red I think these things Feel free to really enjoy the nature of these massive, massive, complicated, multi-layered, multi-faceted synthesizers in which you can create any sound you could possibly imagine. I mean, particularly if you're running a studio, because it is there on tap. Everything you could possibly need is there. So perfect. It's perfect for all of that. But for, for fiddlers like myself, who just like to, to play with stuff and enjoy weird sounds, then um, I don't think there's... I don't think that's a place I wanna I wanna spend any time. Thanks very much. This has been getting a lot of action on the internet. Lots of people been popping up going, wow, this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen ever. And I go, well, what is it? What what? 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 Hey? Eh? And this is Sin Plant 2. It's it looks like something from a long time ago. I can't quite pull out of my head exactly the synthesizers you'd have these circle displays on them. Um, but anyway, this is a bit like that, but obviously more than that. <laughs> some kind of genetic sound designing is going on. Something about you can move some knobs and adjust some things and then exploration starts to happen and, and things start to generate and appear and you know, ovulate and movilate and, and textures and forests of organic matter start to spoo out of different places to give you all sorts of interesting tombras. So we're talking about geno patching technology. <laughs> Something about artificial intelligence. Woohoo! AI, yay, yay! It's in everything now. Uh, that will find the ultimate and optimal synthesizer settings better than you can because it's learnt more than you have and has far more intuition than you could possibly have, and uses that to to grow and generate patches that increasingly match uh, the chosen audio you're running through it. Oh, I don't know. I haven't had time to look at half this stuff this week. So what do you want from me? Huh? What do you want from me? I'm just pointing these things out. Simplant 2. Sonic Charge. Looks interesting. Go check it out. Here's something else that caused a bit of a flurry on the internet. Minimal Audio released a synthesizer called Current. It's a big sort of workstation synthesizer, a bit like Pigments, which has different forms of synthesis inside. Uh, it's very cool. It's written by a bunch of really cool people. It's got some lovely sounds. They went out of their way to, to court um, sound designers and producers and YouTubers to produce presets for it and videos for it and all this sort of thing. Fantastic. Looks good. Looks a little bit sedate i have to say a little bit serious perhaps but it has everything in there uh, and is an extraordinary sound source now the reason it got a little bit more famous than they hoped perhaps is because they opted to go for a purely subscription model and this was not liked by 99 percent of the people who had done all this content and videos for them for their launch because they didn't tell them they didn't tell them it was going to be subscription only because as it turns out, nobody really likes that. I mean, sometimes it can be useful. I mean, I, for instance, I subscribe to Adobe Photoshop because it used to be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds. And it's something that I use all the time. I never seem to have the cash to actually purchase it. So I thought, sod it, eight quid a month. But, you know, it's a deal. It's a done deal. I use it all the time. It's worth it. So I understand subscription models and some of them can work. But for this, people were not happy. <laughs> And they're all really kicked off on the internet. People go, oh, no, I've done all this work and I've, I'm pushing your synthesizer and I'm showing up people how great it is and then you want to take loads of money from us every month to use it. Uh, and then there was other associated problems with downloading more content or presets or samples or, you know, it was a mess. Um, but thankfully, after a, little bit of, uh, after a little bit of resistance, they caved and have now come up with a few different ways to buy it. So you can buy it outright, I think you can rent it to buy it, or you can still subscribe. So that's cool. I haven't tried the synth myself, don't know anything about it, other than the fact that it caused a bit of a stir. <laughs> but I understand it's good, and you can buy it now, so go and check it out. And finally, Transistor Sound Lab, so I ran into at Synthfest, I think it was, have now got chips back 
to be able to reproduce the stepper acid. Now the stepper acid is a fantastic sequencer that they've been building for years. It's their thing, it's what they do. They build this extraordinary uh, sequencer which is really designed for acid baselines and beyond because they can do a lot more than that. And they've had all sorts of terrible, terrible trouble with chip shortages and supply chain issues and all that sort of business over since COVID. So they just have not been able to build them. But they now, once again, have stock. They've had to do a lot of redesigning, a lot of shenanigans, but they're finally able to produce them again, which is fantastic. I am so close to getting one. I, I just think I just don't have the time at the moment <laughs> to look at it. And so I'm going to I'll put it on my to do list to do list in the future. I hope they're also working on their stepper drum, which has had to go through numerous uh, redos and do overs because of chips and supply problems again. And it is really near as damn it nearly there. So those two together, I think, would be a fantastic combination. They're quite big modules, quite serious, but uh, fantastic, brilliantly engineered, extraordinary bits of work. I'm also really happy to, to say that, uh, that Nina from Transistor Sound Labs will be joining us, hopefully, for our patch off at Synth East. So that's also very exciting. Which, of course, brings me to Synth East quite nicely. I thought, Synth East, that's the only thing we need to think about now. I know it's Christmas. Christmas is fine. There's no other synthesizer things that need to get in the way now. NAM potentially. Oh, who cares about NAM? Let's just focus directly on uh, February, the weekend of the 23rd, 24th, 25th, I think it is, of February uh, in the new year. That is Synth East in Norwich. It's the most extraordinary, grooviest, coolest little squat little synth show that you could possibly imagine over a weekend in Norwich, February 2024. It's going to be great. I can't really tell you anything about it because we're going to announce, I think, early next week. So I've just got to hold it in at the moment. But we have some exciting things. Uh, we have some synthesizer-y things. We have modular things. We have some interesting sound design-y things. We have DIY type things. So we're trying to trying to, to cast our net wide, if you like, to appeal to, to, a, to a wider bunch of people as possible. So it's not purely modular or purely this, it's, it's a lots of different things happening. And uh, really got together with Electronic Sound on this to produce an interesting program of events. So it's not also, not just the expos, not just the manufacturers, there's performances something else, more interesting things, some DIY bits and pieces. So really, really interesting weekend it's going to be something for everyone i think you'll find an everything for everyone perhaps <laughs> but it is slowly coming together and as i say hope to announce next week with more or less 99 percent of the details uh, i'll also for manufacturers out there i'll be inviting people to book a table uh, probably next week i'm going to get into that i think so uh, stand by your beds get ready to go and it should be should be a very interesting time so yes Yes, indeed. <laughs> other things coming up. So other things coming up. I've got a whole bunch of videos I'm in the middle of making, oddly. I'm trying to make my 10 year anniversary one that's just taking far too long, but I'll try to have that done in the next week or two because that might, it might be interesting. It's just a recap on, on where I think I am and where perhaps we might be going. So that's fun, or at least for me, that's, that seems interesting or therapeutic or something. I'm also making a video on going mobile with your modular rig. So I've done some battery powered jams out in the wilderness, which has been exciting. So I'm bringing that together. I'm currently right in the middle of building the Bifaco Effects Boy. I have it here, you see, it hasn't quite got its knobs on yet because I haven't tested it. That's the next thing I want to do. But uh, Manu at Bifaco said, can I be on the phone <laughs> when you test it in case it goes foom? Because there's some tricky soldering on the back of there. Let me tell you that for nothing. So I've got a video on that coming soon too. I've also got a lovely new thing from... Um, this is not rocket science. And Era Instruments called the Brinter. Which I'm reviewing for Sound on Sound. So I'll be interested in playing that out. Along with the Maho Mahovi that you saw recently. And loads of other stuff too. I've got the stereo delay and the stereo reverb from Erica Synths. Because this turned up, because funnily enough, just before Synth East, I'm running a workshop with a whole bunch of kids for the Norwich Science Festival, which is the week leading up to Synth East, 
where I hope to be using a whole bunch of bullfrogs. So Erica since have sent me one of these to get the hang of it, to start messing about with it, and to perhaps make some videos um, showcasing how to use it, what to do, like easy bits and pieces. You know, all of that, all of that. I'm gonna give that a bit of a go. It's a weighty, chunky thing that I'm not going to open right now. It's just gonna be a bit of a tease. So there we go, there's a whole load of stuff. Long old one. Long old one this month. It's been it's been fun. I've really been working hard to get videos out this month. That's been my focus. And I've got a lot more of that sort of stuff to come, which is great. I'm excited by all of that. Now, the other thing I'm excited by is our live stream. We're going to have a live stream this Sunday. We haven't had one for a couple of months because of Bristronica and Synthfest getting in the way. So this Sunday, 8 o'clock, right here. We would have got an hour back because we'll be back to, uh, to Greenwich Mean Time, which will be exciting. So 8 o'clock, GMT and we will talk since i'll plug some stuff in we'll make some music i've got a few new bits and pieces i can show you which is exciting and um we'll do that let's do that <laughs> that'll be fun so bring your friends bring a beer come and relax for a couple of hours and we'll talk since talk rubbish talk about all sorts of things that perhaps i didn't mention in the, the molten monthly or things that i did because there's always other stuff going on and I appreciate there's all that moving and shaking in the industry, like with, with Moog and all the layoffs over there, and the, the changes that in music are making to Moog is 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 difficult, difficult to cope with. Uh, other things that are difficult, uh, Bandcamp has been bought out by someone and they've sacked a lo whole load of people and are moving and restructuring, and that's a bit of a worry because Bandcamp is such, has been such a brilliant place to put our music. That and the terrible wars and rumors of wars that are going on around the world is just, it's just, uh, you know, terrifying at the moment. So, our salvation is to be found in control voltage and synthesizers. It's a place where we can we can find ourselves, where we can at times block out the world and at other times let it all in and experience it and express ourselves through those electrons. You know, both those things are possible. So join me on Sunday and we'll talk all about that at great length, no doubt, or not. We'll just make some music with a beer. <laughs> and in the meantime, Go make some tunes. <laughs> <laughs>